Okay, so we'll get started. Um, this week, you know, so far so good. I like what I see. Everything's been coming in at a good pace. Uh, the homework is uh, getting complete and I don't see any real issues. I know I spoke to one or two of you about the last pro pro project and I think everybody's on track right now. If you have any issues with that last project, we do have, you know, the capital asset pricing model and the risk return. You know, the best thing right now is, well, contact me if you're having an issue, but download the spreadsheet and the spreadsheet really gives you good guidance in terms of using the solver function, coming up with the minimum variance portfolio, coming up with the lowest standard deviation. So that would be the best way to handle that. Okay, uh, so let's jump into it, this week's work. And it's on options and options are derivatives, right? What is a derivative? A derivative is a security basically, or that is a function of another security. So in the case of an option, it's a function of stock. So and options could be the rights to buy or sell securities, right? So it could be a call option, which is the right to buy a security, or a put option, which is the right to sell a security. So if it's a call option and the stock is at 100 and the call is, 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 a, is a 90 call, meaning you could buy the stock at 90, well, you'd have to pay at least $10 for that, right? Because you know it's worth at least ten dollars and then you have the option to make money so since you have leverage on that option since that option has more leverage um because you're only putting out ten dollars to control a share of stock you also pay a premium for this and that's called the premium of the option so basically what options are are just as we said they're the right to buy or sell a security up to a certain point in time they do expire options they're as small as a month and they can go as far out as three or four or six months or a year or two years. And privately conducted options between like large banks and large customers or like co companies can go back even, can go out even further. But how do you value these things? You know, how do you value them? You know, first of all, if you want to do some extra work on options, one of the really good um, sites is the CBO. This is where a lot of options are traded. And you can get a lot of information on options. You, know, you can get data on options, volume. You can get, um, you, can, you know, the SIBO really is a terrific place. It can explain products to you. Okay. And an option is like, a, think of it like, um, since this has a finite time, in which case this option could be either in or out of the money, it's going to rely on the fact that the stock moves a lot, you know, that it vacillates a lot, that it goes up and down a lot. So more volatility in the stock, more variance would equal a higher value for the option, right? More time would equal a higher value for the option. Less time would equal a lower value for the option. You know, think about it if I owned a stock for 100, if I was, if I owned it, if I had a company and the stock was trading at 100 and you were a client, and I said, I hired you, and I said, I'll tell you what, I will give you, you come work for me, and I will, in the next year, if the stock goes above 110, you would participate for every dollar above 110. Well, it'd be in your best interest for the stock to really have a lot of variance, because what happens at that point, and take more risk, because then you have the chance, you may have the chance of losing, which would only cost you a small amount because you own the option, or you would have the chance of maybe making a lot of money because the stock might go up dramatically. So you would be for more volatility, more variance. And that's one of the main determinants in the option market. Another really good um, book for, uh, from, and I won't call it a beginner's book, but it's actually one of the Bibles, is this book, Options as a Strategic Investment which um, mainly deals with all of the different strategies you can use with options. So, you know, that's that's kind of a prelim. Let's look at some of the stuff that the school provides, and they always do a pretty good job, very good job. So um, an option is a financial derivative. We talked about that, and it's a contract sold by one party, the option writer. So whoever sell, there's two parties to an option, the person who sells you the option, and they're actually taking the opposite side. Right. If you have the right to buy the stock at 110, well, they have the right, then, then they give you the option and they sold it to 110. And what they're going to collect from you is the premium. 
because the option might be worth 10 on its own. Like, let's say the stock's at 100, and it was a 90 call, an option to buy the stock at 90. The stock would be worth at least 10, and then some sort of premium, like maybe 11, 11 a quarter, and we'll get into how they find that premium. Well, the seller of the option would collect the premium, like an insurance company would collect the premium from you, and if the option never comes to fruition, they would collect that premium. But if it goes higher, they have to really basically indemnify you. So think of it like an insurer and an insuree, right? You're paying the insurance company a premium, and if you don't have an issue to collect on that premium, well, then the insurance company keeps the pockets to premium. But if it goes up, then they have to make good on the difference. So if the stock goes to 200, they have to sell you the stock at 110, all right? Now, there are different symbols we use when we talk about pricing these options. C would be a call option. P is the put option. That's the option to sell the stock. So it's the opposite of the call. X would be the exercise price, because that's the one, remember we did 100 minus 90? Well, this would be the 90. The date would be time, and the underlying asset would be stock. So that would be the stock IBM. The date would see, say, one year out. The exercise price in our example was 90, and the, uh, uh, the exercise price is 90. The stock would be at 100. And the call option price would be at least 10, at least 10. So the Fox option payoff depends on the type of option, whether it's in the money, right? For a call option, as long as the value of the underlying asset is greater or then equal than the exercise price, the stock minus the strike minus the price of the call is your payoff. So in our case, let's say you paid $11 for that call. Stock's at 90. I mean, the stock's at 110. Uh, I'm sorry, stock's at 100. The strike was at 90, so you made 10, but you paid $2 premium for the call, you would have made 8. That would be your payoff. S has got to be greater than the strike. The stock has to be greater than the strike for you to collect. Hopefully that makes sense, right? I've got a $100 stock, I've got a 90 call, right? The stock has to be greater than the strike. Should be sharing my screen. Sorry about that. Share my screen. All right, so let's go back a minute. I did not share my screen. Uh, so this was the first thing I talked about. That's the symbols and that's the stock. And the other thing I didn't, I didn't, that's options as a strategic investment. That's the book I mentioned. And I'm sorry that you didn't see that. Sometimes you got to remember. And this is the CBO website. So what I showed before, I'll have to go over it again is the different products that they go over and different stocks they trade. And you, know, you can get really exotic here in terms of different types of options. You don't need to concern yourself with all that now you're a beginner. But um, oh, I miss, remember some of you may not be beginners, but uh, this is a great stock. I mean, look, even here, you can see which options are most active. We see that the... Uh, well, these are all index options, but I'm looking for a stock that I might know. Apple. The Apple 135 calls that expire uh, April of 21, April 23rd, 21, is a very active option. And go to Yahoo Finance. Yahoo Finance is great. If you have a, a, a trading account, then you probably know a lot of this stuff already. If you don't, it's a great place to start. So Apple's trading 134. And if we go to options, you could see that. What was that? The 135s? Let's see. It was the 135s. So this is the April series. It expires in April. Right? Notice when we get to 135, which is about where the stock's trading. This is the option that they mentioned. Oh, that volume. Notice it's trading at um, 113, one, so you would pay $1.15 or let's say $1.15, right? A lot of option activity, right? And the stock right now is at 133.72. So if the stock goes above 135 plus the 115 you paid, 136.15, you would make money on that option. 
and but it has to happen before 420. It can't happen um, if, if it happens after the option expires is worthless. So that's a big part of the options. These are in the money options. These are options that are in the money. Okay, so you can go to Yahoo Finance and look up the options. This is a great example of, of, of what you would see if you were trying to trade these things. Okay. That's the April 23rd calls. And we saw that in the, um, again, going back to the SIBO site, they mentioned that these April 135s traded 5,847 days. So it's an active option. There's a big trader that went, and here's the 135s going out to June. So I think somebody probably did a spread. They probably either sold one and bought the other. It's just different strategies you could use. We don't have to get too deep into it today. That's where you would find it. And I urge you to look at it. Take your favorite stock and look at it and see um, what their options tr trades look like and how the premiums say. So say I like I, I, Apple is a stock that I like at 133. And um, I think it'll go up by June, I can go out to June, and I can see where the options trade there. So the June, let's say I think it'll go to 140 by June, I can look up the 140 calls. This is the strike price, so I look for 140 now. The 140 calls would trade at $4, 380. So I pay 380 and the stock goes above 140, 380, I would have a profit. But if it goes below, I can only lose the 380. The person who sells that option to me would collect the 380. But if the stock goes above, they have to come up with the money. That's basically it. So let's go back to our. So that's your payoff, right? That's your payoff. For a put option, it's the opposite. It's the strike minus the stock minus the put. So the we want the stock to go down. So in a hundred dollar call scenario, any any price below 100, the stock has the option has a payoff. But we have to pay for the value of the option and the put premium. So again, if I have a hundred dollar stock and the stock is trading at 90, if I hundred dollar strike of a hundred dollar strike price and the stock is trading at 90, I would have 10 points of value and then I would add another two points of premium. And if the option is above, I lose my money. So they give you another example. At the close of trading on April 2nd, 2015, Google was priced at 535, 53. Suppose you decide to exercise a call that the exercise price of 500 and you pay 30 for the call option. Well, what do you suppose your profit is? How would you figure it? I'm gonna give you a minute to think about it. So if you're watching this, give you a minute to think about it. Key word today, it's spring. Spring is the keyword. Spring is our keyword. Take a minute and think about it. Okay, so five thirty five. Less 500 is 35.33, less 30 should be 5.53. And that's how you do it. We could model option payoffs to Google call with the 500 strike price. Think of the payoffs as the function of the price of Google stock. As long as the stock price is at or above 500, you exercise the option. But since you pay 30, you don't really make a profit until it exceeds 5.30. So that's really it. It's just simple math. You pay a premium and you don't have a profit until it goes above that premium. It's really simple math. Any questions? Well, I don't have any of you on here, but email me questions if you have them. Email me questions if you have them. Well, I just want to check if anybody checked in today.
um, and you can use a spreadsheet. So let's take a look at what the spreadsheet looks like. Send out of school. Let's take a look what a spreadsheet looks like. not coming up. I don't know. That's what it would look like. You could just set up a spreadsheet, make this happen for you. One more shot. It's not coming up. Right, here we go. That's it. Simple spreadsheet with different payoff scenarios. And I I really um, would urge you to kind of play with this, see how it works. Okay. Let's keep moving. Um, and that's the payoff. And that's modeling the payoff. So we know that below this price, we can only lose a limited amount and then our loss is limited to whatever we paid for the call. But above a price, we could make unlimited profit as far as it goes. The seller of the option has the exact opposite scenario. They could make this much money, but if the stock starts going up, they would lose that much. Put option is the opposite. They would have an opposite. So notice that when the stock goes down, the holder of the put has this great profit. Stock goes up, they can only lose so much. Although the writer has the exact opposite. They can lose unlimited amounts, but they can only make the premium. Hopefully by now this is clear. So the Black Shoals model allows us, and if you go back to the spreadsheet that the school provided, we have the Black Shoals model right here. And by put and what what happened was Black and Shoals tried to come up with a way to value these things, and the issue was that before Black Shoals, we viewed the differences in prices of stocks as jumps or finite jumps. So what what does that mean? It means that we thought that the stock would go from one price to another in a jump, with nothing in between. Think about it like that: one hundred five and a quarter, one hundred five and a half. But the stocks in the real world don't move that way. Stocks trade continuously, right? They're continuous problems. It's a continuous issue. Stocks could be any fraction of a price, theoretically. So could options. So since the stock has a continuous issue and not a discrete issue, right? What's the difference between discrete and continuous? Discrete is it's a finite number, like the number of automobiles in a lot is discrete. It's got to be 10, 50, 100. It can't be a half. You can't have a half a car, right? So number of, of, of cars on a lot, the number of people in the stadium. It's got to be a fine, a discrete number. It's got to be, say, 24,000. Can't be 24,000 and a half a person. Right? But continuous is like the temperature. It could be anywhere. It could be 93. It could be 93 and an eight. It could be 93.12225. It could be anything. And options and stock prices have that same dynamic for lack of a better term, they have continuous. So what Black Shoals had to come up with was what we call a closed form solution to pricing these options. Okay. So it depends on a number of assumptions. And these assumptions do kind of work away from, kind of create a problem for those trading these options. Volatility, the variance and the interest rate stay constant over the period of the option. Now, in the real world, variance change changes all the time and volatility changes all the time. And that's been some of the research that's done on options. They've dealt with that fact that variance and interest rates do change because one of the functions of an option is the risk free rate or the interest rate, which is saving money when you buy an option.
option, right? You're actually not putting out all the money and you have to compensate someone for that because the seller of the option is bearing that cost, right? Because they have to they may have to hedge that option, right? They sold you the call. Maybe to protect themselves, they may buy some of the stock, which would cost them an interest rate and they're going to charge you for that. Otherwise, an arbitrage would exist. Otherwise, they'd be the opportunity to earn free money. So we assume with an option that no matter how long it goes, volatility and interest rates stay the same. But that's not always the truth. Volatility may change an, an hourly. But it's one of the assumptions we have to make or Black Scholes had to make. The other is that no dividend is paid because if a dividend is paid, then we might see an option get uh, exercised early to collect the dividend. It's really the reason why we assume that. And since we can't predict the future, there are no arbitrage opportunities. Um, it follows a random walk. And what's a random walk? Let's see what comes up here. Let me click on it. Well, a random walk means that everything we that that should have something to do with the price of the underlying stock is already baked into the option into the stock. That's what a random walk means. That the next movement of a stock will be random from everything that happened beforehand. So stocks fo options follow a random walk. And so you can't arbitrage anything, but you can't predict the future. And there's no transaction costs. So because once you put a lot of research has found that once you add fees into the option model, well, then it becomes it becomes more. Um, you lose the opportunity to create, collect any arbitrage if there is any. Any free money, like, for instance, the option might trade like remember I said 90. The stock's at 100, it should be worth 10 at least. Maybe there's an opportunity to buy it at 9 and 7 eighths, so 9.875, and make 212 and a half cents free. But the transaction cost is going to eat that up. And that the probability of the price changes is log normal. That means it's it's continuous and it's a natural logarithm, and that's part of the Black Scholes formula log normal returns. Okay, so we have the call, the price, the put. Two different issues, the strike, the date, and the underlying asset. And that's the Black-Scholes formula. It's the stock times the standard distribution. It's the normal standard distribution, right? ND1, which is the log of stock over strike, which is the log, which tells us the ratio of whether the stock is above or below the money, right? If the stock is at 100, the strike is at 90, it would be a positive log. If it's if it's below the strike, it'll be a negative log. That's where we start with the Black Scholes model. We use the Edo calculus to derive this, which is a way to do calculus from a. Um, it's the way to do, it's the way to use calculus for stochastic, which we mean random continuous um, variable. And we add the rate of return plus the variance, risk free rate plus the variance divided by two. Remember, sigma squared is variance. Sigma on its own is standard deviation. And we multiply that by the time. So this kind of accounts for the risk-free rate, the variance, and the time. And this accounts for the whether the stock's in or out of the money. And we use a standard normal distribution. If you go back to your statistics, it's the bell curve, right? It's the bell curve. We look at the number of standard deviations in order to figure out probability. For those of you who have taken probability or statistics courses, we use a standard normal distribution and we divide over the st standard deviation times the square root of time. And this kind of accounts for time for lack. You know, you don't need to get that deep into it, but this kind of accounts for time. And um, D2, so this D1 thing, when you work it out, is that is the is what we call the hedge ratio. It tells us how much the stock should trade versus the option. If the stock is very much, um, if the stock's at 100 and then you can't collect on the option until it's at 150 or 60, the hedge ratio might be very small because this, the option is really not going to move a lot yet because the stock is so far away from the money. But if it's in the money, it might click, the hedge ratio might be closer to one. And that's going to be a function of this log normal representation. Uh, D2 is the probability that it winds up in the money, D1 minus that. And you're taking the strike. Present value, E is the continuous formula, Euler's number, uh, minus R times T is getting us back to present value. 
and we're multiplying it by n too. So ABC currently trades at 60. The option has a quarter of a year of life. The exercise price is 62. These are all the numbers that you need to understand. Current risk rate is 1%, while the volatility is 40%. Volatility is a very important input. So we use the normal distribution function to calculate the probability of a standard normal distribution and the log to complete the natural logarithm. Calculate these, and we come up with that in the black shells. If you want to try this at home, just plug the numbers in here. You will get the put and call price. And it'll account for all the things. We, and here's the normal distribution. function. So it will account for all the things we've been talking about. There you go. So give it a shot. No question you should give it a shot. Definitely be worth your while. And I hope you understand what we're doing here. Keyword is spring. And getting back, if you want to look at your favorite stock, you can find it by the options on your favorite stock. You can find it here. Go to Yahoo Finance. If you have a brokerage account, it's even easier because they'll provide you with option one. Notice this is a down day in the market. You see a lot of red. Yeah, who find this does a great job. I got to tell you, I started trading in the markets many, many years ago. You didn't have this type of, um, you didn't have all this information. You had to pay a fortune to get this kind of information. And today it's really uh, free, which is terrific. And you got a lot of stories. You know, I, I always urge you, please read the Wall Street Journal. If 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 you if you have some extra money and you paid a lot of you already figure, hey, I paid enough for books, okay. But if you know you're open to it, a fifty, you know, you can get a student subscription to the Wall Street Journal and it really is worth its weight in gold. You shall learn so much about the markets and you'll keep up on all the business information. You know, so I can't stress it enough that uh it's something i've been reading forever and anybody who's a trader obviously but as a business person you really want to take a look at this uh it's the business paper of record for the united states We have markets, see a lot here. In particular, you can find your markets up here. So I've got a window open, it's gonna close it. Chilling in here. Okay. Good. Find stocks, bonds, currencies. It's all here. You could dig deep into the markets. Currencies. And if you want to dig deeper, you just go to market home. Let's say I want to look at commodities. That's right here. So there's a lot here. Let's say I'm, in, I'm interested in gold. And you can look at different charts. Now that's not that doesn't include reading the paper, which has a lot of information. Okay, and move on to financial forecasting and financial statement analysis. We we'll often take basic financial statements and project the values into the future. We do this by making assumptions about future company performance and developing the model to forecast the financials. We will study a simple one period model in the spreadsheet. Open the forecasting tab. So we have our spreadsheet, there's our forecasting tab, and this is a balance sheet. And I also want to point out, this is a typical balance sheet, that if you go to my, and I gave you the links, if you go to my YouTube channel, the Vantrust is great, it's terrific. 
Okay, so we go to the YouTube channel and go here and go to my channel, go to playlists, and go to Accounting Academy. You can get a lot of oil. These are all videos on accounting. And they've been very helpful for the students. And I believe I provided you with the interactive spreadsheet. Also has capital budgeting techniques. So it's here for you. So I urge you to use it. I urge you to use it. Let me know if you need any help with it. All right, so getting back to the forecasting. That's your, that's your model. There's these assumptions, sales growth. Appreciation, dividend payout, interest rates, tax rates. So it's basically just a forecasting. Here's your assumptions here. And actually, did a nice job because they show you here, which normally you wouldn't. You would have to go kind of click on it to get it. They show you by they formulated the text of T D four, which is great. Formula text D four. They actually show you what the the, the stuff is like. That's a nice. That's a neat little. Um, I should mention that's a neat little um, Excel uh, device by by putting by by asking for the formula text. You could see the actual formula in the next um, cell. You know, you could just refer it to that cell. So you can actually see what they did on the spreadsheet, which is great. I think that's terrific. I might go back to my accounting sheets and do this. It's a good job. Very good job. Um. So we normally avoid the situation. Okay, they're just talking about how to avoid a situation um, if you have a, uh, a circular reference. The error happens because many calculations depend on the outcome of a long-term debt value. The debt value can be circular as the debt level then determines the amount of interest paid on the income statement, which in turn impacts that income. So you have, so you have like a circular issue. Uh, you enable inter iterative calculation and it will calculate the long term debt. Value. So it's, it depends on a number of different factors. And in effect, you're getting this circular reference. And the way to solve it is the iterative value. How to enable it, click on the file tab, options, formulas, and in the calculations, enable iterative calculation. And that'll just continue to calculate that particular issue so you get it right. Okay, so you get it right. So once you enable the feature, the iterative option return to the spreadsheet, you will see the circular reference arrows are gone. So let's take a look. I think we did this already, so we don't have that. Okay, but that's how you would do it if you didn't do that yet. Okay, we, can have, we don't have that issue here because we did it already. Uh, oh, here we go. So let's take care of it. Let's do it. I thought I took care of it. So we click the file tab, options, formulas. So let's go back. File tab. down here you got to go to more that made that a little confusing so go to more and then go to formulas and enable up to 100 iterative you don't need more than you don't need 100 say okay and notice that went away it'll continue to calculate till it gets it right so we had a number of things dependent on long-term value okay so um once you've done that, it's complete. A real option is a right, but not the obligation to make a particular business decision. Most projects include con contain real options and financial managers use them in capital budgeting. We will create a one-way data table. So practice creating a one-way data table. 
Following the example in the ebook below, below, the sample spreadsheet is a one-way one -way table. So I'm going to call that up, and this just gives you different tools. Assume your company owns an oil well. Your best guess today is that the oil will be worth $50 million. In five years, you expect to make a decision to develop an oil well at the cost of $70 million. A wildcat offers you to buy the well today for $10 million. So let's look at the facts here. You, your best guess, you think, you estimate that the oil is worth $50 million. Obviously, that's an estimate, and it's going to depend on the expertise of the person making that judgment. You assume that in five years, the you expect to make a decision to develop the oil well at a cost of $70 million. But the oil cattle offers you 10 today. So how would you do it? You don't know what the future holds, but let's assume that the oil well increases by 5% a year. Again, assumptions that you're making. The oil well would be worth 63.7 million in five years. That's by just taking the original value and putting it into a future value function like we did with time value of money at 5%. It's still less than 70 million, and the traditional capital budget tells you that the well is worthless. But wait, there's a chance that the oil well could be worth more than 70, even 80. If that's the case, your company nets 10 million. Okay, that could always happen. It's a five year European call option. The stock price is 50. You could use Black Shoals. It's continuous. It's log normal. You're assuming now another assumption that the vol is five and the T bill is five percent. The value of the call will be eleven fifty. Try it at home. Plug it into the formula. In which case, if it's, it, which means you don't sell to sell it for ten million. Go right here and check it out. And there's the one-way table. I'll play with it at home. I would definitely tell you to do it. Give it a shot. Here's your example. Excellent. And that's it. So you see how we use options in the real world. We don't have to just use them for stop. We could use them for anything. How does an option, where do we see an embedded put option in an auto lease? Think about it for a minute. And by the way, the keyword is sprint. Where do we see an embedded option in an auto lease? Where do we find an embedded option in an auto lease? i give you a minute to think about it. Think about it. Where do you find an embedded option in an auto lease? Okay, so you lease the car, and effectively, they're giving you an option. You're paying for it, probably somewhere. You see it, because you can put the uh, the, call, the the car back to them. You could effectively have a put option. At one point, if you don't want to keep the car, you can give it back to them. So you've given them, they've given you a put option. They've given you the right to sell the car back to them at a specific price. We buy it from them at a specific price. But you don't have to hold on to it. So you protect it from, if, if, if obviously, if you abuse the car, you have to pay for that. But let's assume the car on its own just loses value because nobody wants that particular car anymore. You're protected because the, because the company has to take it off your hands. You effectively have a put option. Or you can look at, you can look at it so you have a call option. If, this, if all of a sudden the car takes on this great value for some reason, you is locked into a certain price. All right, so that's it for today. Uh, hopefully, any questions you have, please ask me. And, um, you know, I'm always there for you. Just let me know. Thank you.